Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Lufkin, chair of MIT's Cardinal and Gray Society. This is our first in the three-part 2021 Virtual Spring Speaker Series. We will have two more programs on March 30th and April 28th, also at 1 p.m. Registration for each will open a couple of weeks prior to the date. I suggest putting these on your calendars now. Today, I extend an especially warm welcome to members of our companion organization, the Emma Rogers Society. Thank you for joining Cardinal and Gray members today and for your enduring support of the Institute. Please be assured that you will have the opportunity to submit questions to our presenter during her talk. Type them into the Q&A box on Zoom whenever they occur to you. We have a allowed time on the schedule after the talk, and I will make every effort to ensure they will get answered. We cannot be physically together today, but we are connected for sure. Nergis Mavalvala, the Curtis and Kathleen Marble Professor of Astrophysics at MIT and a 2010 recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, among many others, is a physicist whose research focuses on the detection of gravitational waves and quantum measurement science. In 2016, the first direct detection of gravitational waves from colliding black holes was announced by the prestigious Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO. Professor Mavalvala has been an active member of this scientific endeavor since the early 1990s when she was a graduate student in Rainer Weiss's group at MIT and LIGO was in its infancy. Since the nature of gravitation is inherently different from electromagnetism, gravitational wave astrophysics provides a radically different window into the universe. In the quest for ever greater sensitivity in the LIGO detectors, Professor Movalvola has also conducted pioneering experiments on generation and application of squeezed states of light and on laser cooling and trapping of macroscopic objects to enable observation of quantum phenomena in human scale systems. Nergis Movalvola received a bachelor's from Wellesley College and her doctorate from MIT. He was a postdoctoral fellow and research scientist at Caltech before returning to MIT to join the physics faculty in 2002. He was appointed Associate Department Head of Physics in 2015, overseeing the department's academic programming and student well-being for the next five years. In 2017, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and in the spring of last year, she was named Dean and the first woman to serve with that position of MIT's School of Science. We have asked Professor Mavalvala to update us today on the LIGO project to give us insight into her vision for the School of Science. So now I pass the virtual microphone MIT's Dean of the School of Science, Professor Nergis Mavalvala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, for this very uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. And thank you, everyone, uh, uh, for uh, being part of our program today. Uh, I have to say I'm very amused to to uh, to hear uh, LIGO as, uh, being referred to as prestigious, because uh, certainly we've come a long way since when I first started working on LIGO as a graduate student at MIT in Ray Weiss's lab when it was uh, considered quite a maverick and, 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 and outlier of an experiment. Uh, but that's part of the story that I would like to uh, to share with you today. I'm going to just take a, a quick moment to to start my screen share and um, and then we'll just we'll jump right uh, right into it. Very good. So uh, hopefully everybody can uh, uh, can see uh, my opening slide here. Um, so. The story that I want to tell uh, tell you all uh, today is the story about not just the discovery of gravitational waves, which is a very MIT story, and many of you have heard it before, sometimes even from me. Um, what I really want to tell you is, is what's happened since. So there was this discovery of gravitational wave, but its real promise was that it was going to open a new window into the universe. And so the question before us today is, uh, uh, is it doing that? And, and so the, the, the story sort of uh, is contextualized around this uh, Nobel Prize that was awarded in physics in 2017 uh, to uh, Ray Weiss of uh, MIT, uh, uh, half the prize, and a quarter each to Kip Thorne and Barry Barish of Caltech for a discovery that shook the world. And that is, the, the I quote from the Nobel announcement, for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. 
So what are gravitational waves? Why was there a Nobel Prize for it? And what's happened since? So gravitational waves are, are, are the wavy part of Einstein's picture of gravity. So Einstein, you know, many of uh, uh, you know, uh, we are all taught in our first physics classes about about Newton's law of gravity and how when you have two massive objects, they attract each other with a force that's uh, inversely proportional to the square of their distances. Uh, and for a long time, uh, even after Newton himself, you know, made this quantitative formulation of gravity, um, he struggled with the idea of what you know, how do these two massive objects know about each other? What mediates the interaction in, in physics speak? Um, well, it wasn't until a few hundred years later when Einstein told us that uh, to forget about gravity as a force, but to think about gravity as geometry. And in, in, in you know, famously Einstein uh, envisioned space-time, empty space-time to be a stretched membrane, if you will. And then when you put a massive object in, in that region of space-time, the membrane um, uh, uh, dips, uh, uh, dips in reaction to the massive object, very much like if you put a bowling ball on the center of a cushion. Now, Einstein's theory also asked the question of what happened when the massive object isn't just stationary, but accelerating. And right out of Einstein's equations, very beastly equations, I might add, uh, uh, came uh, a wave, a wave that propagates on the surface of the, you know, on the, you know, uh, in, in the fabric of the space time itself. And that's how we envision them. Here is a, a wave. Uh, you can think of it very much as, as a wave that propagates on the surface of a pond when you drop a rock in it. And, and what we, we understood early on from Einstein's theory is that you needed very, very compact, massive objects to, that are orbiting each other to generate waves of any appreciable strength. So that was what Einstein told us about gravitational waves. And then very early on in his 1916 paper that introduced the theory of general relativity, he already dismissed of gravitational waves as being useless. They're too faint to ever be useful or detectable. Um, and, and Einstein in his time was right because people didn't at the time know about uh, extreme objects like black holes and neutron stars, which are the lighter cousins of black holes. Those were first observed in the, in the, in the, in the late 1960s, starting in 1967. And shortly after that, this man, Kip Thorne, then a young professor at, at, at Caltech, uh, made the first calculations about what would the amplitude of a gravitational wave look like from these newly discovered neutron stars here on the Earth if they were in a galaxy not too far from our own. And he came up with this, this frighteningly small number of a part in 10 to the 21 as the amplitude of, of the wave. Now, this part in 10 to the 21 translates into a space-time distance. It's a dimensionless quantity, but what a gravitational wave does here on the Earth is it actually shrinks and stretches the, uh, the, the distance between, uh, between objects or space-time distances. And that stretching and shrinking is proportional to the distance between the objects. So really it's a strain, it's a change in length per length. Now around the same time at, at MIT, uh, Ray Weiss, also uh, a, a, a young faculty member in the physics department, was pondering how might be one might you know detect these gravitational waves, and he concluded that they are detectable, and the best way to detect them would be a, 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 an interferometer, a laser interferometer, which I will talk about momentarily, and. But to make these detections, we have to be able to measure changes in distance of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So he turned this number of 10 to the minus 22 and change in length per length and said, well, if we can make the length of the detector kilometers long, then we only have to make a measurement in the change of length of, of, a, uh, of an atometer or 10 to the minus 18 meters. And in 1972, he wrote an, a, 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 a paper that outlined how to do it. And there was born the concept of these kilometer long detectors. Thorne and Weiss met in 1975 and they conjured up the, the first concepts of LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Um, and then there was a campaign of decades uh, from these, this concept to, uh, to consensus 
uh, within the scientific community and eventually the funding agencies to fund these kilometer long uh, detectors. And so the US was uh, 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 ho hosts uh, LIGO with one four kilometer long detector in Washington state in Hanford. Uh, east of Seattle, and another four kilometer long detector in Livingston, Louisiana. Um, but this was uh, this sort of launched a, a global effort and a, and a, a, a partner, a sister observatory in, in Europe is the Virgo uh, Observatory with uh, a three kilometer long detector uh, detect, uh, uh, located in um, Italy. Uh, and then there's a three kilometer long detector that is just coming uh, uh, on the air in Japan. Um, and, and I'll also mention towards the end of my presentation, a space version of these detectors called LISA. And this global network of detectors has sort of sprung up over the, all over the planet, starting with LIGO in the late, 2000, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, LIGO went through a process of building, measuring nothing, building, uh, improving the detectors, measuring nothing. And then eventually fast forward to uh, 2015, when the very first uh, 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 gravitational wave signals were registered in the LIGO detectors. And that comes in the year 2015, the ninth month, the 14th day, so 14th September 2015, uh, when this now iconic li uh, first signals were detected. And it's worth spending just a, a, a short bit uh, part, uh, sort of looking at the, this signal. So you see, first thing you see is two, uh, uh, two uh, signals depicted on this graphic here. And they're time shifted to overlap each other and they're time sh shifted by seven milliseconds. On the vertical axis, we, we notice uh, the amplitude or, of the wave or the strain in units of a part in 10 to the 21. And what we see is that these bumps and wiggles, these very undulations of the signal are a direct measurement of the bumps and wiggles or the ripples of the space time itself. And what we find is that they are, these uh, signals were generated by the collision of two black holes. And as at the very maximum of the signal, which is the moment that the two black holes collide, the amplitude of the wave was part in 10 to the 21. And that's a great big check mark for Kip Thorne. He told us how that, that this would be so in the late 1960s and early 1970s with many refinements in the time in between. Now, if we ask by how, what, how much were the mirrors of the LIGO detectors moving when this measurement was made, again, at the, at the maximum, uh, um, the displacement of the mirrors was a few times 10 to the minus 18 meters. And that's a tremendous check mark for Ray Weiss because again, as early as 1972, he told us how to do this. And those early calculations of his and, and the designs of his, you know, factors of two came and went, but the concepts that he provided were pretty much the ones that were used in building LIGO. And so this was the, the iconic first detections. Now, since then, uh, two years later, there was another very significant discovery uh, made by LIGO. Uh, but before I do that, let me just tell you what we learned from the signal. So the iconic signal, the, the, the very first one, you, we can turn that into a movie. And in this case, this is a movie of two black holes. I'll, I'll go ahead and play the movie so you can see two black holes are orbiting each other. And here, so for artistic effect, we've put the two black holes in a star field. So you can see how the sheer gravity of these two black holes is distorting the light that's coming from the stars. And in fact, some of the rings that you see around, the bright rings you see around the edges of the black holes are light that's been bent from behind the black hole. The two black holes orbit each other and they collide and they collide because their orbit is shrinking. The orbit shrinks because of the energy carried away by gravitational waves. The two black holes collide and eventually they form this new single black hole. And what we learned was that the two parent black holes were about 30 times the mass of our sun. At the time of their collision, they were moving at 
half the speed of light, and this is a moment where you hold on to your seats because this is an extreme event, right? Something that's 30 times the mass of our sun moving at half the speed of night, light is, is a, a, a system that only nature could conjure. Um, this particular pair of black holes was 1.3 billion light years away from us. And by measuring the, 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 but the mass of the, the black hole that was formed and comparing it to the mass of the two parent black holes, we find that the newly formed black hole is three solar masses lighter than its parents. And that's the three solar masses uh, of energy was radiated away as gravitational waves in this collision. This is the most powerful collision at the time observed since uh, the Big Bang. What we also can tell, of course, that that story ends that the two uh, 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 black holes uh, did not live happily uh, ever after, uh, but indeed they gave up their lives to form this new heavier uh, uh, bl uh, black hole. Two years later, another spectacular event was detected by the LIGO detectors. And this time I'm going to I'm going to pull, draw your attention briefly to this plot to just show you the time scale, which I uh, forgot to mention. Uh, the time scale of these signals was a few hundred milliseconds, so a fraction of a second. In point in that we you know these systems exist for 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 hundreds of millions of years, and we in our LIGO detectors observed the last 200 milliseconds of their existence before they plunged into each other. Now the next signal that we saw was different. Now you notice, uh, looking at this time frequency plot where you see a signal, you can see this curve here. What it is, is it says it's a signal whose frequency is increasing as a function of time. And this signal lasted uh, over a minute in our detectors, not a few hundred milliseconds, but, but you know, uh, almost a hundred seconds. And that immediately told us that it was much lighter. Uh, and uh, light enough that we could infer that these were neutron stars and not black holes. Now, neutron stars are the lighter cousins of black holes. Typically, when a, 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 a normal star, much like our own sun, when it runs out of nuclear fuel uh, and uh, it, it collapses. And if the sun, if the star that collapses, this parent star is you know, two, one to two times the, uh, the mass of our own sun, it will collapse to a neutron star. If it's heavier, three to five times the mass of our sun or heavier, it continues to collapse into a, a black hole. So we knew this was a light enough system that it should be a neutron star. And our neutron stars have another very notable difference to black holes. Uh, and that is that they are, as their name would suggest, they're made of neutrons. And that means that when they collide together, it's like smashing the nuclei of atoms together. And we should see a, an enormous uh, and spectacular light show. So here on the bottom, you see what LIGO and Virgo saw. And then indeed, 1.7 seconds later, a gamma ray telescope, the Fermi Gamma, gamma Ray Observatory, um, observed a spike in the gamma rays of, um, uh, on the sky from that region. Now, because LIGO and Virgo were observing together, by triangulation, we could pinpoint that this particular source, this neutron star collision, occurred in a 30 square degree patch of sky in the southern hemisphere. At the time of the observation, it was daytime in the southern hemisphere. So astronomers all over the world could prepare their telescopes in the southern hemisphere to that very night to look for this object. Now, what would they look for? I'll tell you in a, in a, in a moment. What they would look for is that when these two neutron stars are going around each other uh, and orbiting, they only emit gravitational waves, no light. There's nothing notable there. But when they collide, there should be this light show and a new object should light up in the sky. So indeed, that, that very night was what I would call an astronomer's night to remember. Over 70 telescopes worldwide, uh, well, and not worldwide, over 70 telescopes, mostly from the Southern Hemisphere, pointed to that patch of sky. And this is a very busy plot, but I just want to point you to a few really fun things. Uh, on this side here, you see the, that, uh, that signals were observed in virtually every color of light, starting with gamma ray, uh, with 
gravitational waves, then gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio. But what, we, what you see in the bottom panel here is actually the most interesting. What, these are images of a particular galaxy. It was NGC 4993. Uh, and, and no, there will not be a, a quiz on that part of it uh, later. And what you see is next, you know, at the outskirts of this galaxy on all of these telescope views, these are all different names of different telescopes that went to observe. Uh, some of them in the optical, and in fact, on the right over here, also X-ray uh, uh, observations. And you notice that in the crosshair, there is an object. Now, zooming in on one of those telescopes, DLT-40, one of the first to observe this object, notice the same crosshairs at the same location for the same galaxy 20 days earlier, and there was no object there. Indeed, there was an enormous amount of excitement. We had discovered for the first time we had observed the collision of two neutron stars, and these observations were enabled by the fact that the gravitational waves were, were, were detected before the observation. So um, an artist's rendition of what this would look like in this movie, two neutron stars orbiting each other, giving off nothing but gravitational waves. At the moment of collision, and a tremendous jet of gamma rays, and then as time goes by, optical infrared radiation being radiated by this debris of neutrons that have collided. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the movie and, uh, and the music uh, courtesy of our friends at NASA, uh, they, they like to, uh, I, I guess it's dramatic, but uh, I do enjoy seeing it because it gives you a very visual uh, idea of what happened. Now, in, that, in the, those optical observations, one can also look at the different colors of light coming out through spectroscopy. And one will see as a function of time, notice that, the, uh, that these are days going by, you see different peaks appear in the spectra. So different colors of light are, are becoming brighter and dimmer as the, as the days go by and we observe this object. And this, these observations form the basis of solving a decades long mystery that has existed here on the earth. And this is the story of where gold comes from here on the earth. So we have known for a long time that we have too much gold here on the earth. And you, you might be really baffled by this statement because uh, arguably there isn't enough gold. It's, seen, it's thought of as a precious metal. In fact, entire civilizations have been won and lost over gold. So, but astrophysically speaking, there's too much gold on the earth. Now, most of the elements of the periodic table uh, are formed in stars, we know that. And indeed, when we look at heavy elements like gold and platinum, we, we know from the, 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 the physics and chemistry of, of, of our uh, stars like our own sun, that those could not form these heavy elements. They, there's no, the, they're, it's energetically unfavorable for a star like the sun to form in much abundance elements heavier than iron. So the next possibility would be that maybe these are formed in the explosions of stars in, in supernovae. And it turns out even there, you don't, the, in the, the, it's not a neutron rich enough environment to create these heavy nuclei where you have to pile neutron upon neutron in to form the nucleus of such an element. So it has long been thought that neutron star mergers or collisions should be one of the places that where we one, one would form these heavy elements like gold, platinum, the lanthanide series of the periodic table. And indeed, the, that, that movie I showed you of the time evolution of the spectra of the different colors of light and, and the different uh, peaks that we saw, we was the observation of these heavy elements being fused in this neutron star collision. And in fact, if you look at this, this uh, picture of uh, the periodic table, um, I draw your attention to the bright yellow boxes uh, and, and, and the, 
the portion of, the, of each rectangle of the element that is covered by the yellow box tells you in what abundance that particular element is, it would be fused in a neutron star, uh, star based on, on, the, on, on these uh, collisions. And so those observations have led us to now understand uh, where these heavy elements uh, come from here on the Earth. And many of you have long heard said that, you know, Carl Sagan, I think, was the first to say we are all stardust. And indeed, now we can add to that. We are, in fact, quite a bit of us is neutron stardust. Now, since that discovery, um, LIGO and, and Virgo have continued to, to make discoveries. And there are with more than 70 different sources detected since that very first uh, and, and now iconic detection. And indeed, what you, what you see is that many, many mess, mysteries prevail. So uh, I've, I've highlighted two of them in these pictures on the right. Uh, one of them, GW190521, is the first observation of what's called an intermediate mass black hole. And what these are, are, are a mystery object. We don't quite know how nature would form them because the, the black holes that are a few times the mass of our sun, maybe even up to 10, 20 times the mass of our sun, one could, one, it's, it's very, it, one understands that those are formed by the collapse of stars. But mo it's really difficult to form stars that are much heavier than a few, uh, you know, a couple of 10 solar masses. So how do these 85 solar mass uh, stars form, 85 and 66, and indeed then merge to form this 142 solar mass star is a mystery. Another very interesting object, GW190814, is the first observation of an object where we don't quite know whether it's a neutron star or a black hole. And those are known as mass gap objects because there is a gap in where, where a, a, a star can collapse to being a neutron star and where it's heavy enough to collapse to being a black hole. And so this object, this 2.6 solar mass object lies in this mass gap where is it a neutron star? Is it a black hole? Is it some other object? And we don't know. And so as, you know, so certainly my, you know, entire career has been spent continually improving the sensitivity of the detector so we can continue to see fainter objects farther away. And as we do that, not only are we am amassing the number of mysterious objects that we're seeing, but we're also starting to see some patterns of, of how, you know, how these black holes uh, uh, form, how, they're, how they form mergers, how they collide. So um, uh, I would say that you know, looking to the future, there's a brilliantly dark and very warped uh, future uh, to this whole, this whole enterprise of observing the universe with gravitational waves. So one of the very exciting things that's all being led here at MIT uh, uh, by my colleague Matt Evans is, is the development of, 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 of designs uh, for future Earth-based observatories, and in particular in thinking about about making longer detectors, 10 to 40 kilometer long detectors, a cosmic explorer here in the US, an Einstein telescope in Europe. And one of the most amazing things to contemplate when thinking about these, the, these future uh, detectors is shown in this little graphic that I put up here, where it, with, with designs that we think are, are achievable and, and, a, and perhaps even you know, affordability is a, you know, is, 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 uh, depends on what lens you look at it through, but maybe a bit even arguably affordable instruments, we have the ability to map out black hole collisions for these, you know, typical tens to, of solar mass uh, uh, binary black holes. Uh, black hole mergers out to a redshift of more than 10. And this is really exciting because this particular you know, redshift of 10 is an important number because that's where we believe the first stars in the universe formed. So if you can observe to a redshift of 10 or greater, arguably you, you will be observing every black hole merger possible in the universe ever. And that to me, when I think about it, is an amazing idea that within the first few decades of ever observing black holes colliding, we may be able to observe every black hole that has collided. And 
so that's a very exciting thing. There's also, I, I mentioned earlier, there are there is a, the, a concept for a, uh, not a concept, very much an, an active project for a space-based observatory, LISA, which is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, uh, which has a launch date of 2034. It is a, 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 a mission that is led by the European Space Agency, but uh, you know, with participation uh, from NASA. And one of the things that I, I, I put this, this sort of busy graphic up for is to sort of highlight what the differences are. On the right, this set of curves is the sensitivity of these Earth-based detectors like LIGO and Virgo and Advanced LIGO and, and, and beyond. And those are good for detecting gravitational waves from sources that are, 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 are emitting at uh, in, in this, in around 100 hertz. So, you know, 100 times per second, these objects are going around each other and smashing into each other. Now, when you get to much, much more massive uh, objects like supermassive black holes, these are black holes that are at, at the centers of galaxies a million to a billion times the mass of our sun, these objects are not going to be whipping around each other at 100 times uh, per second. They are lumbering around each other at, 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 a, at you know, once per 100 seconds or so. And for those kinds of objects, we have no technologies that would allow us to detect them from here on the Earth. And therefore, uh, that motivates going out to, uh, into space. So when you think about space versus Earth-based observatories, they're not either or. They're, they're, they're very complementary. They look for completely different kinds of objects, very much as you might think about an optical telescope versus a radio telescope, looking for different wavelengths of, of light emission. Likewise, these are different wavelengths of gravitational wave emission. So let me sort of conclude by, I hope I've convinced you that these gravitational wave observatories are living up to their expectations. They have, are, are indeed launching a new era of gravitational wave astrophysics, the, you know, starting from the first direct detections of these gravitational waves from these, this, you know, these iconic bumps and wiggles of the space time itself. Uh, to uh, confirmations of Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, and then uh, binary black hole mergers and neutron star mergers. We're observing these uh, in real time. Many, uh, you know, many observations per month when the when the detectors are 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 up and running. And for someone who has you know spent her entire career working on the precision of the measurement, it's also really wonderful that the the darn machines work with these sub atom meter precision that's needed. But I will say that, you know, looking back at this moment in time, you know, historians of science and humanity 100 years from now, these, the details of these observations is not, and, and these detectors is not what will endure, but the moment in time that we have, and the, the paradigm shift, where we've turned on a completely new way to observe the universe, where we can use gravity instead of light, or as along with light, uh, as a tool for, for new and unimagined uh, discoveries. Uh, so I, I hope I've left you with this, this sense of, of, of the expansiveness of the field and that it's moving quickly and that, you know, as, as, uh, as a group gathered here who are, you know, who are from MIT, off MIT, and this is, you know, a, a, a story that, that MIT has, has really uh, shaped over many decades. I thought I would spend a couple of minutes just telling you a little bit about my story and how I sort of came into, uh, into this. So uh, I, I'll tell it in pictures. So here is a photograph of, of me standing here, right here in our labs on MIT campus in 1993 when I was a new uh, graduate student in Ray Weiss's group. Here is Ray Weiss. And here is a prototype of the of the LIGO interferometer in uh, in in the background. Now I came to MIT from uh, uh, after completing an undergraduate degree uh, in physics uh, uh, and astronomy uh, at at Wellesley, where where I got my first taste of of working in a lab, uh, and uh, and then that love of working in the lab sort of continued with me. Here is a photograph of me in, in around 2000 uh, when I was a postdoc at, uh, at Caltech. And this is by now in between 1993 and 2000, something important had happened. The LIGO observatories had been built. And now was the work of installing and, in, you know, uh, and and commissioning the first detectors. So here's a picture of me in the control room at our Washington uh, observatory. and. Uh, 
all pictures of me in those days looked the same. I always wore uh, a hat and I always wore cargo pants that were filled uh, with uh, uh, connectors and, 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 and tools. Uh, and here it is actually, I mentioned Matt Evans, who was then a graduate student when I was a postdoc. He is now a professor here at MIT and leading the effort to, uh, for, the, for the next generation of, of gravitational wave detectors. Um, then here is uh, the same group, Ray Weiss standing in the middle here in 2015. That was Ray Weiss up there. And there's me uh, uh, again in front of a prototype of, of, of LIGO in our, uh, in our labs at MIT, different labs now. Uh, many of the people in the group are, are still also in this next photo, photograph, you know, 20 years uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, later. And that uh, comes uh, from, you know, it's a testament to, you know, Ray Weiss creating a group around him that was really dedicated to the cause. Um, this is me doing the gravitational wave dance with Neil deGrasse Tyson shortly after the, the, the LIGO discovery. Um, this is me in, in, this, in our labs. I like this picture in particular because it really shows you the prototype facilities that we have had here at MIT that have really allowed us to go from conceptual design and having an idea in our heads to being able to, 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 to build, do proof of concept experiments at MIT. And then because we have these large scale prototyping facilities here at MIT, we can quickly get our technology into the LIGO uh, uh, detectors. Um, this is a, a photograph of me at the, at the press conference on the day that the first discovery of, of LIGO was announced. This was a press conference held at MIT. Again, uh, uh, me sitting next to Matt Evans. And I particularly like this photograph because it, it highlights two, you know, two of my, 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 my greatest loves. Uh, I've spoken at great length about, uh, about uh, LIGO, uh, but this photograph is me have, sharing a private moment with uh, my then eight-year-old son who was in the front row, a little bit bored, waiting for activities to begin. And this was me just pointing at him and saying, I got you, kid. And so I, I, uh, I, I see this as a melding of uh, the two parts of my, uh, my life uh, together. Uh, the Nobel Prize got us a, a, a trip to Stockholm, which was really one of the most uh, uh, you know, emotional mo moments. I, I, you know, I realize I'm the first to, to, to acknowledge that the Nobel Prize is filled with, uh, with inconsistencies and, and biases. But in this instance, I think they really did get it right. Uh, and so a group of us gathered to honor our, our laureates. Uh, and then you know, serving MIT. Uh, you know, I, I've been. I was associate department head for for uh, for five years in physics, and this is a photograph I love. This is my favorite day of the year, which is the seniors in physics, the, the physics majors uh, at at senior dinner, uh, uh, two or three days before commencement. And I love it because this is a, a moment to, we, where we celebrate the successes of all uh, our students, and this is what we as educators really live for. Uh, and then uh, since then, I, I, you know, since September of last year, I've, I've become the uh, Dean of the School of Science and the world is a slightly different place. So here is a picture of me uh, at Dean's Council uh, and we have, you know, sort of gone from three dimensional uh, space to a two dimensional uh, existence. Uh, but here is a group of, of happy deans. Um, I want to end just by sort of telling you a little bit about my dreams and hopes for the MIT School of Science. Uh, these are the departments that, that, are, that, that are, are within the School of Science, biology, brain and cognitive science or neuroscience, chemistry, earth and planetary science, mathematics and, and physics. So I sort of laid out a very, a, a, a very um, sort of straightforward agenda. Um, as a dean of the School of Science, uh, the role of science cannot be highlighted enough. You know, uh, for those of us who who are anxiously awaiting uh, uh, the the uh, uh, COVID nineteen vaccine or have gotten one, uh, there is you know is an amazing story of how the technologies for messenger RNA as 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 a vaccine and a therapy were laid in the nineteen late nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties right here at MIT in our biology department. So really the, the simplest vision that I have is that we have to understand the fundamental way in which uh, the natural world works so we can develop 
solutions for some of the most challenging problems that humans face. And these are the, the big ideas are the health of our planet. Nothing is, I think, more pressing and urgent than that at this moment in time. And MIT can and must and does and, and will play a role in, in understanding the science so we can design the best solutions. Uh, we humans have long wondered what are the origins of life? Where do we come from off our planet, on this planet, all the way to, to, to us as human organisms, uh, human health? What are the fundamental building blocks of, of, of the, the universe and what laws govern nature? These are the big questions we're asking within the school. Um, I see my own role as supporting our faculty and students in making discoveries and creating the solutions. That's really uh, the, the sort of the, the role I, I see my, myself in uh, as, as being an, an, an enabler of science after having had the taste of doing science. I want every person to have that ability. So, uh, so that's something I really would like to do. That's one of the roles I'd like to play. Um, I always tell my own graduate students this and, 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 and now uh, you know, I have a chance to, to think about this uh, also in the, uh, in the context of, of, all, uh, of all of the science being done at MIT, which is to tackle important and relevant problems. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that that's a problem where there, there's a solution today. Goodness knows that's not what I mean because you know, I myself worked on the discovery of gravitational waves for, for 25 years. But I mean, it's problems that will have, um, you know, lasting and meaningful impact and, and, you know, put in the, you know, the, the foundations now for the, what will be the technologies of the future. And then none of this science, this beautiful science we do can be done without the people that do it. And therefore, I'm also very committed to creating a, 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 an equitable and inclusive culture at MIT where every single person can do the very best science that there, there, that, you know, that is, there is to be done. And so those are sort of the big ideas that I have. And I, I'll stop here and, and uh, stop my screen share. And I'm happy to open up to questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One of the, the real benefits of being both an MIT student and also an alum is the ability to be exposed to people such as yourself who can not only with great articulation describe how science works, but the, the emotional energy and the excitement comes through too. So that's just terrific. And then on <laughs> top you. of that, gravitational wave dance. What, what more could be asked for? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm looking at our questions. Um, turns out that half of them all seem to have the same subject, the same general area. So I'll let you chew on this one. Um, if gravitational waves are inherently different from electromagnetic waves, mm -hmm. why do they also travel at the speed of light? And I've got about six people so far who've asked the same question, please. <laughs> That's, a, that's actually a, a profound and, and beautiful uh, question. So the first thing um, I would say is not all theories of gravity would agree that they have to travel at the speed of light. The, that was one of the, the underpinnings of Einstein's theory of general relativity. But there are alternative theories that may not be, be predicated on, on geometry, but on, on alternative, uh, you know, fi uh, forces or you know uh, that would argue that they the speed of light would not apply to gravitational waves but in Einstein's theory they do and for me that's a very profound uh, uh, um, sort of connection because ultimately gravitational waves carry information look look that's precisely what we've done you know we are taking the information carried by the gravitational wave and turning it into some knowledge about the system that emitted it. And Einstein's sort of limit on, uh, you know, on the speed of light was a limit that, that has, has time and again stood up to questions of information, energy, you know, you know, cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So I do find it uh, I would say perhaps a relief, certainly our measurements to the precision that we are able to do them have, have corroborated and verified and confirmed that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. And that gives me some comfort that our understanding of the speed of light as a universal limit to the 
transport of information is 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 mm -hmm. perhaps correct intriguing you sort of have rephrased it in terms of speed of light being electromagnetic waves to the speed of transmission of information which make, makes it globalizes it then intriguing yeah. um how are we to interpret the time axis of your plotted waveforms when time itself is also stretched and shrunk by the waves hmm. yeah so that's a that's a very uh, that's a good question um, again um so you know it turns out that uh, time is, of course, uh, also altered uh, uh, as a space by the gravitational wave. There's two parts to this. If you were very close to the source where the wave was generated, then mm -hmm. indeed you would have to really account for this alteration of time because you're in the region of very strong gravity, very strong distortion of space time. Mm -hmm. By the time the wave gets to our detector, you know, yeah. billion light years away, space time is hardly rippling at all. And don't we know it? Imagine we had to make this measurement at the level of an atometer to see these space time ripples. So uh, the answer is that that these are the space time, space and time are 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 combinedly uh, embedded in Einstein's descriptions of space time and they are therefore in these waveforms they're also accounted for but even if you didn't really account for for it by the time we get to this very weak field that we're in the time part is really not doing very much but mm -hmm. it, it but but you'll be relieved to know that it is uh, it is certainly rigorously and mathematically included in our calculations okay. uh, so uh, john duncanson asks Two questions. Are gravity waves longitudinal or transverse? And the second part of it is, as gravity waves propagate, what is the restoring force compared with the propagation of electromagnetic waves? Yeah, so first question, they are indeed um, transverse. And what that really means is, uh, so what does this transverse wave uh, look like? So if the wave is traveling uh, say into the plane of the screen that I'm pointing at and pointing at you, then the actual space time shrinking and stretching is happening transverse to the direction of propagation. So the plane of your screen is stretching and shrinking if the wave was moving normal to the screen. Okay. That, uh, now it's very much the same way as you think of an electromagnetic wave, right? The, if the wave is traveling towards you, the electric field is oscillating out of that plane uh, and, okay. on the, and the magnetic field. So yeah. it's very much the same in, in, uh, uh, in that sense. Now, the second quest part of the question was about, uh, uh, about you know, radiation reaction or what, you know, what's the, you know, what is the, when this wave propagates, what does it, uh, you know, what, uh, what does it do? So this wave, very much like electromagnetic waves, also uh, attenuates uh, as one over r in amplitude. So as the wave leaves the source, it's falling off in, in amplitude as, as one over the distance, very much as we do okay. with electromagnetics. OK. Um, how often does LIGO detect an event? If these black hole collisions occur over a space of a few seconds, does LIGO have to be lucky and be looking at precisely the right time? Yeah. So, um, uh, so look, any anybody who who ever says that there wasn't at least a little bit of luck in a, in a discovery uh, <laughs> is is not uh, is not is deluding themselves. So of course we're lucky, but we're we're not. You know, we're we're scientists, not luckologists. So you can calculate the statistics of 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 the rate at which we should see things. So the first thing to know about LIGO and, and gravitational waves of this kind in general is that they're not very directional. They're, they're you know, a, a telescope points to a single point and you can really point to a, 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 a source. Gravitational wave detection uh, detectors have a large acceptance angle. They are most sensitive to sources coming directly overhead to the L. But they also have sensitivity in, in all other directions, like a lobe. You can think of it as, yeah. as a peanut lobe of two lobes of a peanut, um, uh, you know, normal to the plane of the L. So we are not just lucky. We actually are listening in all directions at all times. Okay. And, and then by having multiple detectors, two LIGOs, one Virgo in time, you know, Kagra and, and other detectors, 
you can use triangulation to say where on the, uh, uh, you know, where the source was located on the sky. So based on, 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 on those things, you have a certain rate at which you would expect to see sources that, that includes not just your, the sensitivity of a detector and its directionality, but also at what rate is nature uh, you know, making these collisions. And that's something we're learning. We had rudimentary estimates of this before LIGO's discoveries. And those estimates, let me remind people, included the number zero. <laughs> but there would never be any collisions because nature doesn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. So we are starting to get a better handle uh, uh, on those things. Uh, but the fact that we're, we're detecting, you know, uh, at this point with the sensitivity improvements we have, you know, roughly one per week, is sort of consistent with what we would mm -hmm. understand from the rate at which binary stars could form binary black holes or neutron stars, and then those would, you know, eventually okay. collide. So, uh, what are the units of the wave amplitude? Is that a meaningful yeah. question? <laughs> it is a meaningful question, and 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 one that that you know uh, we all uh, would get dinged for on 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 our quizzes if we didn't add units. But it turns out. Um, it is dimensionless. 10 to the minus 21 is a dimensionless number, but it ha in the end, in a detector, it has dimensions, or in space time, it has the dimensions because it's change in length for length. It's a strain. Mm -hmm. So if I take an, 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 an object, uh, let me see, my handy dandy ruler, okay. that's a length. And now the dimension of the wave is that if this is a, a 30 centimeter, imagine it's a meter just to make the numbers easier. If this is a meter uh, of space time distance, when that wave of amplitude 10 to the minus 21 comes through this space time distance, it will shrink and stretch my ruler by 10 to the minus 21 meters. So that's the, so the dimensionality it comes from once you say, what does the wave do to a, 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 a space time distance? And it changes it by uh, that amount. Okay. In her book about the history of LIGO, Jana Levin gives great credit to Ron Draver's contributions. Why has he not been mentioned in the earned praise for Weiss and Thorne's work? Yeah, so let me say a, a, a few things about that. That's a, that's a, that's a, a wonderful question, and uh, I knew uh, Ron Draver well, and Ray Weiss did, of course. So Ron had many technical contributions uh, uh, to the early concepts in LIGO. And in fact, one of the, the most important uh, techno optical technologies used in LIGO uh, was uh, came from Ron Drever. Um, what happens is, so, and Ron has had a lot of the credit. In fact, if you look at the earliest prizes that went to the LIGO discovery, major ones, the, 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 the Kavli prize, for example, those were shared by Kip Thorne, Ray Weiss, and Ron Drever. Now, the Nobel Prize in the meantime, Ron died a few months before the Nobel Prize. Uh -huh. So it's pure speculation on our parts whether he would have been awarded the Nobel Prize or not, but by their own rules, uh, it could not be done. And he in fact uh, had, had not been active in, in, in LIGO for, uh, for a couple of decades before the discovery. You know, he'd mm -hmm. gone on to doing other things, but his role in the early days and in, in establishing of the important technologies cannot be overstated. Thank you. Uh, can the issue of dark matter and dark energy be addressed using this technology? Yeah, <laughs> great, great question. We would love to. Uh, okay. It turns out that for any kind of direct observation of dark matter, uh, it's very unlikely because dark matter, as as we w what we know of it right now, it's very diffuse. It actually is, you know, diffusely distributed uh, uh, in in galaxies, for example. And what these gravitational detectors are 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 meant for is exactly the opposite: very condensed, you know, uh, clumps of gravitational mm -hmm. uh, matter. Right? Neutron stars, black holes, the most dense, condensed, compact objects you can imagine. So the radiation from dark matter would be imperceivable to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the LIGO detectors. Now, there are some sort of slightly speculative ideas out there about how the behavior of black holes, like the ones like we like to detect, may be altered if they were sitting in a, in a, in a clump of dark matter. 
and those could have some weak but measurable effect on the signals we measure and that's the kind of thing we would definitely look for but but sort of this diffuse dark matter that we know pervades every galaxy uh, that's not something we can measure okay the original expectation for ligo is that it was going to find mostly neutron stars and yet most of the ones that have gotten most of the publicity have been colliding black holes does this change your perception as to what the universe is all about so you know yes and no so uh, you know i i i, I myself for the longest time carried with me the idea that you know we are building an instrument that will first see neutron stars and indeed as the question says that's not what's what's borne out so after that first discovery of 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 the 30 solar mass black hole i kind of went back to look at one of you know kip thorne wrote a book he wrote a book in the late 1980s early 1990s mm -hmm. it's actually a rather fun book to read if anyone would you know, likes to read such things uh it, it it's called um uh, einstein's outrageous legacy so it's called uh, uh black holes time warps and space foam something like that. i forget the title name but if you look up kip thorne you'll you'll find it and already by like the you know within the first chapter or two he has laid out 30 solar mass black hole collisions and that those are a target for LIGO. So I think what happened was that because black holes and especially binary black holes in this mass range had never been observed. I mean, no, because there's no other way to mm -hmm. observe them. Yeah. People were, I think, had become a little bit leery of being, uh, of sounding too speculative to talk about them. But Kip was very clear that nature should make them and this is what they would look like by the way if you read that book you will also notice uh, already by the by the uh, early 1990s that the entire plot for the movie interstellar uh was laid out in in that book and if, if people who don't know kip thorne uh you know was uh you know was one of the masterminds behind the movie interstellar so <laughs> yeah. if gold originated in or by neutron stars what was the path into the interior of the earth Wonderful question. I ponder this myself all the time. Uh, and the reason why I love this question is, you know, you know, we we hear about these philosophical uh, or nice sounding words like, well, telescopes are really time machines, because when you look far back into the uh, out, out into the distance, you know, look a further distance out into the universe, you're looking further back in time. And that's all true. But really, it's really driven home by this, uh, uh, this observation, because what it tells me is that at some point in the history of our universe, in this neighborhood of our solar system, there was a black hole collision. And whatever okay. material hmm. that was, that was okay. swept up in the formation of our solar system, which is, you know, four and a half billion years, years old, but that's still a fraction of the age of the universe. And so in the earlier moments before our solar system formed, there was a neutron star collision around here somewhere okay. uh, and and so that's that's how i would i you know i understand it the question then becomes have there been enough neutron we've we've talked about the viability of uh, earth style planets and and alien life and all of that is that dependent on neutron stars happening to have occurred where our particular star well, that's where well, it gets really. You know, <laughs> I, I will again speculate here since it's not really, it's, I'm not so expert on this. I will suspect no. And the reason is that if you look at the elements that are seen sort of as the building blocks of life, at least life as we know it, uh, they don't include the heavies. Those, those uh -huh. are the heavies. Okay. The heavies certainly play a role in us functioning uh, as organisms. Uh, but yeah. we, but we evolved with the heavies, so of course we'll function as all organisms because we evolved with the heavies. So it may be <laughs> that that in other living either. systems they evolve with other elements. Yeah. So I don't think it's a necessity. But again, you know, at this point I'm just having fun with the question. This is not <laughs> a scientific uh, uh, answer. Okay, time is just about out. I regret we do have some more questions, but let me give you at least one. Uh, what about your current job, Dean of, Dean of Science? What made it seem exciting and challenging enough to interest you? 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll let, let me just say a, a few things. Um, the one I already talked about, which is I have, I have been so aware that I have been part of you know, a very significant discovery, and that was a gift given to me by others, you know, others at MIT who sort of run the whole place so that you know, a young faculty member like me could go off and do something so e exciting and interesting. Uh, and I just felt like it was really, it, you know, it was time for me to do that for, uh, for others. So that was the, the service piece of it. Uh, the other piece of it was I feel so excited by the all the other science that's being done and I'm learning at an incredible pace I have you know I haven't done you know chemistry or biology since I was in high school and I really was excited by the idea of learning new science uh, and have playing a role in in shaping you know the science the scientific discoveries of the future um, and so those were sort of the things that excited me I also am very committed to issues of diversity and I kind of felt like it was no you know uh, it's easy enough to complain about it but it was time to get up and do something and so all right you know here I am okay thank you I believe that uh, well I said at the beginning that I would aspire to answer all questions regretfully we haven't gotten to all my apologies but thank you so very much Anurgis this has been just just very electrifying I, I just love these talks and I really appreciate your willingness to share your time today. So ladies and gentlemen, regretfully, we must bring this program to a close with great, great thanks and appreciation. Thank you for your time and effort and extraordinary insight into technology. And I'm going to let the, uh, the computer is now in the sky is going to turn us off and we can go on. Thank our you, everyone. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.